I'm Gal Beckerman, and my book is The Quiet Before, on the unexpected origins of radical ideas. I wrote it in response to something that I'm experiencing, that we're all experiencing right now, this sense that communicating online, communicating on these big public platforms feels like it's not creating real intimacy or friendship or the kind of things that we sort of imagine that it is. But I wanted to apply that to this notion of change and how change happens, because it seemed critically important to me from looking at the history and all that you do need these sort of spaces, these spaces where people can actually intensely engage with one another, imagine, debate, begin to think up new ideas. You start back in the 17th century with Peresque. Yeah. He gets Galileo out of jail and gets him onto house arrest. He's this really romantic figure for me. Can you tell us about him a little bit? Peresque was the hub, really, of this enormous network of letter writers spread all throughout Europe. They call themselves the Republic of Letters. These were intellectual, mostly men, who were, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> is what it um, is. I don't know, I'm apologizing for it, but it is what it is. Um, uh, you know, clerics, um, aristocrats, who were beginning to do what we now call science. They were, but, they, but it was quite dangerous at the time because the dogma of the church was still supreme. Uh, they set the terms of what reality was, like where the sun and the earth were in relation to each other. Um, and these were people who were slowly beginning to chip away at those certainties. And they were doing it through carrying out experiments, sharing data, making observations, and getting one another's feedback on them. It was this incredible uh, sort of collective process of, of learning new knowledge about the world. And, and letters were critically important because it was a medium that is uh, kind of embedded patience. Like you, you have you mm -hmm. to write a letter, you have to sort of it takes time. It takes time to digest what's being said. You can sort of slowly bring people on to your point of view. And that really worked for them in terms of both staying under the radar a little bit. So they, they were not, they didn't get in trouble the way Galileo did, but they were still able to carry out their work and do it as a slow kind of deliberative, iterative process over time. The story that I focus on is he's, he's trying to figure out the correct size of the Mediterranean Sea. The maps people were using were 1,500 years old. They were the maps sanctioned by the church, and that's the way that it was. And he had a sense that, that no, that we need a better transcription of nature, right? So in order to do that, you need longitude and latitude, right? Latitude is pretty easy because you can just measure the height of the noonday sun. But longitude, to carry it out, you need observers placed in lots of different parts of the world, all observing the same celestial thing happening, say an eclipse, and, and observing when they see it. And the difference in time will give you longitude, mm -hmm. right? But to get that, he, the people that to, to do the observation are mostly missionaries. They're mostly religious men. The very people who would be most likely to just like listen to what the church says about things. So he needs to convince them. And this is where letters become so important. He convinces them to come along with a scientific experiment. He's sort of controlling them, you know, trying to recruit them slowly, getting them to see that what they're doing is actually going to be helpful for the future. And it's just sort of fascinating what they, he was trying to get them to do was change their entire relationship to nature. You know, if you th or, and knowledge. If you think that knowledge comes only from what the church says it is, and I'm telling you, no, actually, with your own eyes, you have the power to sort of revise what the church says or come up with new knowledge. That's a, that's a radically different approach to thinking about our relationship to the natural world. So, and, and you know, it's almost the most radical thing one can imagine. You know, it's, 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 it's the nature of truth and like how truth is actually produced. So a tweet would not have helped him, you know, like no. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to slowly bring these, these men over to his way of, of thinking. And that's why it suddenly opened up to me this sense of, wow, the, the letter as a medium was so helpful in this because it, it did embed that sort of patience, that slow thinking. It did create an atmosphere in which, you know, over time he could begin to bring them over and he was not trying to move too fast. He was sort of finding the right arguments to fit each person, uh, you know, getting them to th begin to think like scientists. It's, it's fascinating to see it sort of take place slowly over time. 
and it's incredibly dangerous too. Yeah, trying it's to dangerous. Trying to alter yeah. thought away from the, what the yeah. church is saying. Yeah. I mean, wow, that's. No, I mean, they, they literally, there was a man 20 years before this experiment named Giardino Bruno, who the church had burned in a public square mm -hmm. because he started saying, well, maybe, you know, the earth isn't the center of the universe, you know? So, <laughs> so this, is not a, this is not something that people are to take lightly, you know? You use technology in every chapter. Yeah. It's a different technology for each section that you're looking at. You've got letters, you've got yeah. petitions, you've got newspapers in Africa, it, all of those. Yeah. Why did you make those particular choices? We think about the medium that we use to make change as being the most important sort of element in actually affecting a difference in the world. You know, I mean, if you talk to people, that's how you, if you could just get like a hashtag to go viral, you know, or <laughs> that will change everything. So, mm -hmm. so we're very accustomed to the idea that a medium, a form of communication has a critical role to play in social and political change, right? But we have a bit of amnesia about like the entire human history, <laughs> like before, <laughs> like 30 years ago, That's right? That's very true. Where people did not have these digital tools. And, and, and there are really interesting ways of understanding sort of what works and what doesn't work if we just sort of step back into the past and look at something like letters and not just take for granted that, oh, that's the thing that existed, but actually line it up with, with a Twitter and see what the difference are you know, between those. Or take something like a, a real world petition where you have to go and collect signatures and go door to door and compare that to you know, something that you just click on online. Actually like, do that progression throughout history of different forms of communication, a different medium, you know, and what it could provide the group of people who were trying to incubate something new. That was sort of the heart of the, of, of the project. So in order to do that, I needed a comparison point. And so going historically and looking at things pre-digitally, different forms of communication, that was really helpful for that purpose. The petition, which was an extraordinary thing when you think about it, they, this was 1838. And you know, England had the sense of itself as being a very democratic place you know, from the time of the Magna Carta. But in reality, there was a very small sliver of men who were allowed to actually vote. A very, yeah. very you know, small percentage of the population. You had to have property. Um, you had to prove a certain kind of status in society. And at the same time, you have uh, industrialization is really like picked up in a big way. And people's lives are, are really suffering as a result. They're living conditions. I mean, it was pretty awful by the 1830s to go to like a Manchester or a Birmingham. So, you know, they're saying we want to be able to impact the way the rules work here about how long the working day could be or whether children should be able to have to work or, you know, but they don't have no lever. They have no power at all. And the thing is, they don't even really think of themselves as a constituency. This is, again, this notion of like mm -hmm. minds changing. So they don't think of themselves as being a working class that should demand its right to vote. They're just like people who are suffering under the yoke of, of having to work <laughs> crazy hours and not make enough money and, and see you know, their, their whole cities turn black from coal smoke. And so the only leverage they have is this weird loophole in British law where you can petition the king and parliament. And, but it had only really been used in sort of for like land disputes and really small scale things. But here comes this movement called the Char Chartism that it says we're going to petition that we should have the right to vote, right? And they managed to collect 1.3 million signatures in 1838, which is crazy. You know, I mean, uh, when you think about just the logistics involved in getting that many signatures onto a single scroll, the scroll couldn't fit, by the way, through the door. They had to take off yeah, the like. This, <laughs> this is not change.org, no, right? No, not change.org. This is, this is and, and another way that it's not change.org, and this is, this is my bigger point, is that the process of going out and convincing people to sign this thing, it, the, the function of it as a medium is not just let's represent ourselves to power because we're putting 1.3 million signatures on a scroll. It's I have to talk to you and like and let and let you understand that like we're in this together. We're working class. This is what it means to be working class. You should really sign this thing because you know it means that we're that we're representing ourselves to power and then we're making a claim for a certain rights. 
And this is a huge thing because then what, what spun out from that petition drive was a real sense of collective. A constituency was born. Um, but the cohesiveness was the petition. It's the thing that sort of brought them together. Because there was just a lot of angry people out there running around with stakes and, you know, in, in night burning things and like, but the, but the <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah, they, they got yeah. in trouble. They got yeah, they in trouble. Got in trouble but the, the petition was a, was a way to sort of brain everything and focus it onto this point. You know, let's, and, and, and it was a literal point where it's sign your name here. So I, I, I became very fascinated with that as a kind of a, this, this important tool that they had because it demanded work, right? Getting people to sign those petitions demanded work and it provided a kind of framework for, for moving them from just being scattered angry people to being a political constituency, which is so important if you want to make any claim for power inside of a, you know, any kind of representational system. Black Lives Matter was a really interesting chapter for me to do because this was a group of activists who had sort of gotten on a, gone on a learning curve, you know, <laughs> over yeah. the last 10 years. Yeah. You know, they, they saw what happens when you have the world's attention suddenly turned towards you and you don't necessarily have a plan for what to do with it after everyone sort of goes home from the protest. Like they experience that, these highs and lows. You know, the social media attention could be like a sugar high. It could like be exciting, <laughs> you know, and, and feel promising and then be like, oh wait, but like if we want to change the way policing works in our town, what are we doing to actually change the makeup of the city council? or you know, convince more people who are skeptical of this idea that they should come along with us. Those are on the ground organizing things you know, that, that a lot of the people that I talked to came to understand that they needed to do that hard work. The one, one group that I focused on, uh, the Dream Defenders, um, was a local group in Miami. They actually did what they called a blackout where they deleted their apps for two months because, and it was really useful for them because they ended up going door to door and really yep. talking with people in their own communities, you know, and they began to realize that their ideas about abolishing the police were not really, you know, acceptable to people there. They didn't want to get rid of the police. They weren't happy with certain aspects of policing, but they didn't, in the very people that they were supposedly representing were like, no, we don't actually want that. You know, we don't <laughs> want to get rid of all the cops. What they wanted was a conversation about how things could be different. Right. And that forced the activists to sort of moderate their own points of view. If they were gonna to claim to represent these communities, they needed to really talk with them and you know, set up forums for conversations and come to a new set of demands and a ways to get to those demands yeah. that would be actually consistent with what everybody wanted um, and not just about like yelling very loudly you know, and getting everybody provoked and angry. Do you feel like you're a radical thinker? Is that why you're a journalist? Is that where you do what you do? I don't know if I'm a radical thinker. I think I'm very interested in the way that change happens in society. That I think that the, 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 the process by which, you know, we can all have one accepted consensus reality and then that can shift over time, mm -hmm. like that's really interesting to me. Because, because I think it, it's a combination of lots of little processes that happen and, and there are places you can look like, like communication and the, and the modes of communication, the way those change that can help you sort of understand what might lead to one kind of change or another. But, you know, like my, my grandparents were all Holocaust survivors and I mm -hmm. grew up with all of these stories of them living in one sort of environment that then a social environment that then changed dramatically <laughs> over the course of just a few yeah, years, you know, much. there was stuff that was maybe under the surface that they understood was threatening, but it didn't come anywhere near what would happen to them. And so I think I grew up always with that sort of sense of, you know, there is something fungible about the way society and politics works and that there are forces that can shift things very quickly, you know, or even slowly, but in dramatic ways. And so that's a real curiosity of mine. So I don't know if I'm not like, you know, putting myself on the front line necessarily, but I'm interested in sort of standing to the side and seeing you know, what's, what's happening? How, how is it actually working? Well, I think everyone should be reading you because I think you are. Oh, well, thank you. Gal, thank you so much for being here. This was fascinating. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching Word on Words. I'm JT Ellison, keep reading.